Hello and welcome to the next event in the Southampton Institute for Arts and Humanities series, Public Lives. My name's Professor Joanna Safair. I'm co-director of the Southampton Institute for Arts and Humanities and a professor of archaeology at the university. And together with my colleague, Dr. Nick Clark, who's an associate professor of human geography, I'll be co-chairing the event. Before I introduce our distinguished guest this evening, I'll just do the usual quick housekeeping things. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the event. So please feel free to put your questions in the Slido Q&A and then we'll be asking a selection of them to, to Richard following our conversation. So without any more ado, let, let us begin with, with our event. We are absolutely delighted to have you with us today, Richard. He's one of the most distinguished social thinkers in the world and a true polymath, I think, Richard. He currently serves as the chair of the UN Habitat Urban Initiative Group, is senior fellow of the Centre of Capitalism and Society at Columbia University and visiting professor of urban studies at MIT. Previously, he founded the New York Institute for Humanities, taught at New York University and at the London School of Economics and served as president of the American Council on Work. And over the course of the last five decades, he has written about the social life of cities, changes in labor and social theory. His books include The Hidden Injuries of Class, The Fall of Public Man, The Corrosion of Character, The Culture of the New Capitalism, The Craftsman, and Building and Dwelling, and more recently, Designing Disorder. Among other awards, he's received the Hegel Prize, the Spinoza Prize, an honorary doctorate from Cambridge University and the Centennial Medal from Harvard University. In 2006, he was chair of the jury of the Venice Biennale, and he also chairs the Atrium Mundi, an international network which brings together young architects and planners with artists working in cities. He grew up in the Cabrini Green housing project in Chicago, attended the Juilliard School in New York, and he studied social relations at Harvard, working with David Reisman and independently with Hannah Arendt. Richard, we're, we're thrilled and delighted to have you with us today. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Well, I'm very glad uh, uh, to do so, to be with you. I'm a little daunted by all the questions you, uh, you've asked me in advance, but I'll try to do my best to answer them. Thank, thank you. I'm going to ask you a few surprises in there as well, I hope, because oh, no. we may not get through all the questions we sent you, but we've had quite a lot of student interest in this uh, event too, and, and they've also wanted to contribute. And I know that many of them are, are on the, the, the call this evening. So, so the beginning is always a very good place to start. And I'd like to take you to the start of your career and back to your student days. In your book, the Craftsman, right at the beginning of that book, you cite your former teacher, Har Hannah Arendt, and she says, um, a life without speech and without action is literally dead to the world. I wonder how much your relationship with your mentor and your early experiences as a musician and the performances that you must have had to engage with there have influenced your, your public life and your attitude towards your career going forward? Uh -huh. uh, well, I, I, now that I'm very old, uh, when I look back on my life, I think that the period when I trained as a musician really set up uh, the way I practice sociology. Um, uh, because uh, the whole thing about, I was a chamber musician, I am a chamber musician, I'm a cellist. The whole thing about, uh, about playing chamber music, it's cooperative. It's not solo work. Uh, it's not really orchestral work, which, which is a mass of people. You're both an individual voice and you're with other people. And that's sort of been the model 
that I've had in the um, throughout all my sociological work, which is how do people remain distinctively individuals in the midst of cooperating with others or making politics with them and, and so on. Um, I'm, uh, it may be just a defect of mine. I'm, uh, I can barely add two and two. So I, uh, traditional sociology was just closed to me. My eyes glaze over when I see percentages of anything. Uh, but on the other side uh, of this, I was sort of interested in um, the way in which people interrogate their social surroundings uh, to, to, to find something that is, if not unique to themselves, is particular to themselves. Anyhow, that's a very long-winded way of saying that Arendt and I weren't on the same page because she's, Hannah was really interested in the collective. As a person, she was, uh, she was always interested in other people. But I would say that she was more genuinely interested in categories of social life than in individual interpretations of social conditions. So um, it, um, I learned an immense amount from her, but I wouldn't say I'm an Arendtian, you know, that, uh, that I took on that way of, of, of uh, thinking about the world. Yeah, so uh, following up on that, thing about cooperation, I mean, that has really been something that is a theme that, that has run through a lot of the work that you've, you've written. And you've written about how cooperation requires skills and competencies, including the subjunctive mood. And I think that that's, I think that's really interesting for us in a world where we're, as public scholars, often forced to try to be categorical about what yeah. it is that we're saying. So how have you in your in your work and your impact beyond academia and all those things that you do outside of this, the, the academe, the university, use that? How do, you, how do you navigate that tension between the expert and the knowledge of the expert and the idea of cooperation and the idea of, of subjunctive mood? Uh -huh. Well, um, you should know about my biography that uh, I loathe academia. I hate teaching. Um, I don't want to have a position. I'm not interested in the defects of other scholars. I'm interested in what's good or distinctive about them. It, I chose the wrong career. And I sort of righted uh, my own experience uh, by going to work for the UN, which I did Early on, as soon as I, um, you know, I've done all this work on labor, and as soon as I finished my time as uh, the American Council of Work, I started um, consulting for the UN. And the thing about that is that's very, it's very interesting, if very difficult situation for cooperation, You're dealing with people who are very different than you racially, ethnically, of, uh, nationally, all of that. Uh, people don't tend to get along. Uh, there's lots of conflict and it makes doing things together more interesting because you're not on the same page. You're having to cooperate with people who don't like you, don't understand, they don't like you, they don't understand you, you know, but you have to get things done. And I always found that really stimulating. And uh, when I retired from academia, finally, when my pension kicked in, I went to work for the UN full time, and which I've been doing the last, really the last 15 years. I find it enormously satisfying. Even the long meetings, you know, have a kind of poetry to them about, about the amount of time that people can say very little and, and, uh, and with 
and, and stretch it out to an hour. I like all that. So the practical work I've done has meant a lot in my writing, frankly, has meant a lot more to me than being in academia. If I had to choose over, um, I, and I'll say something about that, I would never have gone into this pursuit. And I would like to see young people get out of it, particularly in Britain. It's, it's so bureaucratically uh, suffocating. There, there are lots of other ways to be an intellectual, there are lots of other things you can, you can do, social service, um, all, all of that. But um, uh, so that, that's me about this. I mean, I was, when I, I, I worked as a professional musician for, for 10 years, and when I stopped it, I sort of was, uh, uh, was very confused about uh, about what to do. And at, in the 70s, academia was booming in Britain, booming in the US. And it, it seemed like it might be a hospital home, a hospitable home. But after a while, I realized this is, I don't think that academic life and intellectual life really pair very easily with each other. That's been my experience. Mm -hmm. Can I follow up a question there, Joe? Yeah, yeah, over to you, Nick. Um, it's a question about institutions, Richard. You've, you've written a lot about the importance of institutions, especially in the corrosion of character and the culture of the new capitalism. Um, and so I was wondering, and when, when you've begun talking about universities and the United Nations, maybe you've begun to answer this question, what have been the most important institutions for you in your public life? Um, and you've also written about the, the fragmentation of institutions in, in recent years. So are there institutions that you feel are now fragmented and that you that you mourn or you or you miss? Um, and where do you see the, the institutional potential at the moment for a, a publicly engaged scholar? Uh, well, as I say, I don't see that public engagement inside of academia. Uh, since I read a lot about work, I've been very much in, uh, absorbed with the question of how uh, labor unions can renew themselves. They've been, they've been weakened by flexible capitalism. Uh, which has taken aim at these kind, at any kind of collective action, uh, uh, and that's not only in, in uh, blue collar occupations and white collar occupations as well. And I would really like to see unions re-energized and uh, their scope broadened so that they're kind of bridge between uh, individuals and a society that doesn't, you know, whose power structure doesn't mean to do them good. By that I mean that um, things like, uh, I think, uh, you know, unions should run old age homes, you know. Uh, they certainly should run schools. Uh, they uh, uh, should, be much more sociable centers uh, than they they have been recently. Um, and, and I mean, in most of my work, I'm, I'm interested in what Tocqueville called this intermediate zone of voluntary institutions rather than state institutions. And um, it's, uh, it's something I, I am very happy with what's happening uh, with Unite, the wonderful uh, union, and uh, it's broadening itself to be a kind of mediator between individuals, the state, it's become a civil society institution. So that's a kind of, of um, that's a kind of institution building, I think, that 
needs needs to go on. And uh, it has to, uh, as with American uh, labor unions are now the same union will encompass people in lots of crafts, different white collar, blue collar work, and try to forge a community along those lines rather than follow the old uh, uh, craft model of a union for each distinct separate um, uh, uh, work activity. And that I also think is really good. Uh, um, I mean, the, the irony, I guess for me, I've had a lot to do with politicians over my life, and I've never believed in them. I think it's an inherently corrupt activity because uh, it's so narcissistic. You know, I, and now we don't need to mention <laughs> this afternoon, uh, but, uh, you know, I think it's kind of typical that, uh, you know, we have somebody who's doing people enormous harm. And the first aspect, the reaction of her colleagues is, well, what's this going to do to the party? That's, you know, that's political narcissism. And uh, I just think it's endemic to politicians. I think it attracts people who like to be in the limelight, you know, who are immodest in some kind of fundamental way. And we need to protect ourselves against them. And uh, as the whole notion of that, you asked me about a rent in this way. I think, I mean, one thing that happened in Hannah's life was that early on, she had, I think, the same kind of position. You know, she was a very ambivalent Zionist, but what she liked about Zionism was these kibbutzim, you know, these these uh, these voluntary uh, labor labor spaces. And then uh, later in her life, she sort of lost that civil society focus, and she became much more focused on political institutions themselves. She had a very um, she had a very rough time with being Jewish, not least because of, of um, uh, her, um, her relation to her mentor. Uh, and, um, but in the beginning, I think this was very much part of her point of view that the labor movement, particularly the Jewish labor movement, should be focused on these on, on places of labor, on communities of labor, rather than on strike activity alone or the wage activity alone, you know, and so on. So that's a kind of inst it's a kind of institution that's really interested. And, and of course, cities are another institution that have that kind of porosity, uh, non-bureaucratic side to them when they're alive. And that I'm also, of course, also interested. Um, th that's really interesting. That when you talk about unions and just at the end there about cities, you you almost sound optimistic about the, the possibilities for public life at the moment. And I find myself thinking about some of your early books in the 1970s, which were kind of about the withdrawal of people from from public life or the, the remaking of public life as um, in the image of private life. So I, I wonder how optimistic you are today compared to, to say the 1970s about where, where the opportunities are, are for public life. Uh, probably much more. And this is an, an effect, not just to me, but to other people who live as long as I do into their 80s of just growing old. The notion that, you know, after it's all downhill, there's nothing people can do, you know, you have to have essentially a defensive and critical stance against society. 
is something when you get into your 80s, it's not a good way to die. You have to believe that something is, no, I'm, I'm serious about this. You have to believe that something will survive you um, and that it's possible for people to make a life. Um, the last thing I have in the teaching I've done, which I've e ever wanted to inculcate in students, the last thing is the notion that they're really helpless. That's terrible. That's, um, it's just, um, uh, it's something that would be insupportable. You know, I had a, uh, a long talk, you know, my great friend Bruno Latour died a couple of weeks ago. And I had a, a talk with him sort of when he knew he was going to die, but it wasn't in the last stages of this about um, climate change. And he said, you know, he had sort of moved from, from thinking nothing could be done to, you know, he had this whole theory of uh, Goya, uh, Joya, and, you know, Gaia rather, and um, that the earth would rebalance itself, would heal after humans left and so on. And that become, became something that was stronger and stronger in his life as the cancer Proceeded, and I understand that um, emotionally. You want to feel that somehow life is going to go on, and I do feel at this moment, uh, if we could withdraw from a session with politicians and formal politics, and look into more immediate forms of social action, that there are there are reasons to be hopeful. You know. With, um, certainly in Britain, the politicians are going to do nothing for us, you know. Uh, but I think people, they, you, you have a long tradition in Britain of uh, uh, settlement houses, of, of collective action at a communal or an urban scale. And you have to renew that because uh, the state, whether it's right or left, is going to let you down. That's, um, I knew that when I wrote The Uses of Disorder uh, 53 years ago, but it, I didn't feel it the way I feel it now. One of the, um, one of the things you've, you've written about over those 50 odd years, uh, continually really, is the relationship between the city and public life. Um, and over that period of time, a, a lot of life has moved online. And I've been wondering for a while if we were going to get a, a Richard Sennett book about the online world oh, and good. public life. Well, I'm such a klutz with technology, as you've seen <laughs> earlier today, that I, I'm not sure I'm qualified to do that. Um, I, I mean, again, it's the technology is neutral. It's how you use it, how it's configured, how you get um, engineers to think more culturally, more more sociably. It's the you know the the the, the uh, actual machinery itself will do whatever it's told to do. I think. Um, but I, I don't think I'll live long enough to write that book. I'll tell you what I'm doing now. Uh, I am tomorrow, I hope, finishing a book on called The Performer, which is on uh, what sociology uh, um, rather clunkily calls performativity. And I've sort of been thinking a lot, this is something that also happens when you get very old, about how the parts of my life fit together intellectually. And I've really wondered about the ways in which the performers l learn, for instance, memorize or learn uh, physical gestures, uh, or the ways in which they learn to interpret 
things which they themselves have been created might have analogs in the social world. And um, uh, it's a discussion I've, I've had with friends like Judith Butler, who have, of course wondered ab about this in um, terms of gender studies. I'm sort of more interested in, in, in it in its kind of physical, visceral, rather than socially ascriptive ways. Uh, and it feeds into the world of work because a lot of work is physical performance. And it's really satisfying when it's a physical performance. It's why um, craftsmen tend to get a lot more pleasure than from their work than bankers do, even though bankers make far, far more money. It's, a, it's, it's empty this early. So anyhow, that's what I'm doing now is rather than trying to write about something I don't know, write about something I know very, very well. Um, and it's a, um, it's a really, Curious to me, it, the one thing that I don't, I, I write by hand, I don't write on, on the computer or anything like that. What kind of pleasure you can get writing on a screen? I don't understand that. I mean, the whole thing about writing is that it's a physical activity. You cross things out, you go slower, faster, depending on on what you're thinking or feeling. And uh, it just, um, it is a puzzle to me how, how uh, this very immaterial technology can be used in, in, in writing. I don't, I don't get it. But that, again, maybe just uh, affected the, the way I write. So, so is that this craftsmanship a model for life? Is it a model for living? Absolutely. <laughs> now, here is a question for you, which I posed to Rowan Williams when he was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Is a religion a craft? That is, I know that a lot of secular activities, uh, the craft model, the notion of visceral, physical, experience um, and the disciplines of learning how to do, make something well, the spirit of craftsmanship uh, are all important. And they're really where we get pleasure in life. But what about religion? Do you have to learn that to do it well? Are all the visceral aspects of it, the bread and wine, all of that, could you believe without them? You know, I tend to think not. <laughs> uh, this, uh, I have to say, he didn't, um, he wasn't on the same page about this that, that I was, because uh, he's a spiritual leader, you know, and the spirit comes over the flesh. I don't believe that at all. Uh, but uh, that is a question. I mean, what are the limits of this kind of, of craftsmanship way, which is also the way of art, of developing a craft of expression. What are its limits in life? Are they secular? Um, on the other hand, what about love? Is that a craft? You know, it's perfectly possible to love well without, you know, being, um, uh, being a kind of psychological um, uh, expert, you know. So I mean, that's that's kind of issues that that have preoccupied me and now preoccupy me about about uh, artistic expression when it's performed. So I'm also wondering if we're talking about craft and, and craftsmanship, um, 
it's something that I see a lot, that relationship between the material and the historical and the social that's sitting in this sort of triangulation in your work. And to me as an archaeologist, I find that really, really interesting and also very inspiring. But I think that's also quite quite fascinating in terms of, of your career and how you have used that historical dimension within the way that you start to think about things. So where, where does that historical interest come from and how do you feel that you play with that in your work? How do you feel that you're using it to drive forward your own thinking? That's a small question. <laughs> Yeah, it's a small one. We only do small yeah, ones here. Well, I don't think what I've ever believed is the statement that the past is a foreign country. I, yeah. Uh, I've never believed that. Uh, and uh, by learning history, we expand what we know about human experience. I mean, that's in a sort of simple way. But I think there's a kind of larger dimension to this, which is the notion that if uh, time uh, is the passage of time really puts us out of touch with people before us, we lose a particular capacity for empathy. Uh, if we say you take a, a somebody who is enslaved and made the middle passage and became a slave in the new world. And you said you need to understand all the particular circumstances of that uh, experience in all its difference from us in order to understand what it was. That's a kind of break in empathy. And it works the other way too, that the People who lived in the past, uh, poor things, Kant, Hegel, uh, really couldn't understand us because we passed into this thing called modernity. Uh, I think that's um, it's it's a kind of issue about the um, about kind of celebration of otherness in time or in space or between people, which I think is very malign. It really cuts off uh, the kind of empathic understanding of what others have experienced, or indeed what, how their experience would illuminate ours. So I've been, I've been sort of out of sorts with the whole kind of theoretical discourse about othering and queering because I, I, it's a kind of alienation effect, which I don't think is, is good. It's not good to think that you are isolated from people who are different than you in space as well as in time. It's just not right. And it means that, um, that you're demeaning something in yourself, which is to look beyond yourself into something which is not you. Yeah, I think that's that's an incredibly helpful way of, of thinking about the relationship between people and people and others. And I'm all, but I'm also struck by the way that you you talk about self knowledge as painful work. I think you've used that phrase yeah. in in your work before. I think you used it in the foreigner, um, mm. and and you've alluded to things like that before. So. There is, is there a tension there between self-knowledge and painful reflection and that kind of connection with others, which is a much more optimistic notion of a relationship between people? I don't know if I'd quite make that opposition uh, in quite the way you put it, if I may say so. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, because I think... Uh, when I, when I wrote the book on The Foreigner, what I was really interested in and remain interested in is the role that displacement 
plays in our understanding. Uh, and that uh, uh, most foreigners, certainly my family during the Nazi period and after, uh, had to make sense of living in, in two dimensions at once. One was the dimension of their memories, and the other was the dimension of where they ended up. And um, I think it, it, which is an experience of loss, but also an experience of arrival. And I think that in a way, exile is that kind of complication that exiles know is a way of rooting themselves in kind of a, a kind of emotional realism about being in the world. You know? um, if you ever read the memoirs of a 19th century anarchist named Alexander Herzen, who was exiled to, to Britain uh, by the Russian czars. The most amazing thing about it is that he's constantly at work on his own tendency to nostalgia. Nostalgia about a regime which expelled him, which, uh, which was a mortal danger to him. And that's a kind of, that's kind of internal work that I think gives people a very rooted sense of, a very realistic sense, I would say, of what it means to be in the world, that you're not rooted. You are not a Heideggerian creature to come back to Hannah's teacher. Um, and that's good, that it gives you a kind of insight into the limits of, of human action, which people who are rooted to a spot don't, don't have. Um, and if you don't have that, that kind of uprooted knowledge, you get in practically into the twist that Brexiteers have got themselves into, thinking that, you know, this can be a self-contained country, uh, get rid of all of us foreigners, uh, things go back to, uh, to normal, all the blacks will disappear, you know, all of that. Um, and that makes people very unrealistic. And uh, when I, uh, it's an infantilizing in a way, isn't it? To think that you can always be rooted to a place securely there in control of your borders and so on. These are, these are childish fantasies. And um, so that's why, I, I, when I wrote The Foreigner, that's why what I was interested in about, about this, how kind of uprooting is a kind of passage into adulthood, if you like, especially adulthood. Can I ask you a question, Richard, about your relationship to psychology and it's just stimulated what you're by what you have just said really about childish fantasies and um you, you do a lot on psychology in in yeah. some of your early work and the uses of disorder and and so on um it seems that in your later work you've been perhaps a little bit more interested in the body and um materiality and so on um do, do you see that progression yourself or I suppose, I never thought about it. I, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that's true. I mean, I, you know, to reading um, Freud has always been a kind of touchstone for me, but I, I don't think I'm a Freudian or anything like that. But um, I, I don't, I really don't, don't know. I, I, um, what I uh, what I've been struck by, you know, that my my book on working class labor, hidden interest of class, is just being republished by the wonderful Verso Publishers next fall. 
And reading it through, the one thing, there are many, many errors I made. But reading it through, the one thing that I think I got right was a kind of intergenerational tensions, which are psychological between working class families, often slighted in particular, particularly by this kind of romance of the local and so on, you know, generation after generation. And, so and it was important to me reading someone like Eric Erickson, the psychoanalyst, to understand how those tensions could be married to experience of labor, those intergenerational tensions. But um, I, I guess you're right. <laughs> I don't know. Joe, we're about at quarter two. Yeah, we're, we're, I think, coming up to the time for questions from from the audience so please do send in send in your questions and um but simple but simple you ask me the meaning of history i don't know <laughs> simpler questions simpler questions then richard would like some simpler questions me, me one... One... go on nick sorry joe i was going to say that there was one from one of your students that I quite liked. Jo, jo has said her master's students reading some of your work, Richard, and um, one of the students was was thinking about your book Building and Dwelling and the notion of open and closed cities and wondering how optimistic you were about the direction of travel in cities at the moment. Do you, do you feel that they're opening up? Are people becoming more competent? Are, um, is urban design at the moment producing open forms of space? Or, did, or do you have concerns about what's happening in planning urban development? Well, this is a huge issue because I think that my generation of people, who, of urbanists, not me because this but my generation of urbanists were all into master planning. That was the notion of seeing the city as a whole, you know, that there was a, um, uh, that it was an organism that fitted together uh, 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 and should fit together, it was dominant. What I see with young planners now is that they have enormously clever ideas and strategies about how to work from the ground up, uh, to take a street, um, uh, even to take the space around a single building and think about it relationally. And, um, and, and that's particularly in the work we were doing in the UN, that's particularly important in terms of housing because uh, people, well, a little younger than me, but people who were trained in the 70s or 80s made mass, they favored these mass forms of housing that were agglomerations of huge, huge buildings. You can see it whenever you travel in, in China. You can see these huge, uh, these huge settlements in which everything is is of a piece. So I think there's a big pushback now in urbanism to um, uh, not to so much to go more local, but to to make more differentiation, be much more attuned to the geography of particular places uh, and their climate needs and all of that than was true before. The problem is that that's not economically productive. What's productive of profit is still to build these huge agglomerations, particularly of housing. Um, the madness of the extreme madness of that is the Saudi 
Arabian notion that they're going to build a 70 mile long city, one long corridor. That's how capital thinks. Right? That the bigger, the more, the more profitable and the more functional. And so I think probably as a kind of capitalist system is uh, in the investment side of cities is now in such trouble. My hope is that these younger, more contextually minded uh, architects and planners are gonna be able to effectively push back. Maybe not in Britain because it's still uh, centralized planning is very strong in this country. But in um, uh, 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 certainly in Italy uh, and Greece and uh, Austria, in take some European examples, you're seeing people who think in this more hands-on, local, visceral way, actually taking over uh, planning councils and so on. So that's 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 really a good development. Um, and I have to say, this goes along for me with my interest that you raise this about the kind of bodily, uh, visceral, with my interest in, in making that uh, an experience in cities that cities provide. Uh, it's just the opposite of Google uh, driving by Google Maps that you'd actually drive by what you see and by how you relate to it, um, which is a totally different experience of place. You know, it's what I like about walking. It's what I uh, like and regret I can no longer do about cycling, which is, it's a way of being in a place rather than moving through it. And I, I think we'll recover all of that. I'm hopeful about that, uh, that the, um, um, just because this crisis, you know, capitalism built itself up in the first two uh, decades of, of this century, essentially by um, a building, by de physical development, investment in real estate, global investment. Now I think that's mercifully coming to an end and there, there's an opportunity to do something quite different, which is much more about being in a place rather than moving through it, you know? And I'm hoping this Saudi city is a kind of last gasp of an old idea of planning. The, the questions are, are coming through quite thick and fast now. We might not get to all of them, but the, there's one here. How would you include people's embodied or embedded, I think it's embodied sense of local pride and strategies for urban planning and civic regeneration? Pride being something that is uh, something that our, our local councils and certain government would like to encourage us to have. Uh, yes. And no, <laughs> um, uh, you know, that something goes back to the work of Jane Jacobs, because for her, uh, the local was essentially the neighborly. You know, that people know each other as neighbors. And, and, and uh, uh, that's why you could have eyes on the street. Remember that famous uh, formulation of hers that people would know if something is wrong. That doesn't really suit a modern city, which is full of people who are moving, who are immigrants, who are different and diverse. And um, rather than neighbors, I think we uh, need to think about ways in which um, people are, are act as citizens to each other. That is, to give you a very home homely example, if you see a kid being menaced on the street, you'll interfere even though you don't know anything about that kid, you know? That there are certain kinds of norms of public behavior which people support 
whether they uh, whether they're neighbors or not. Uh, this is a big issue for us in New York because, uh, uh, oddly enough, and it's what I love Jane Jacobs, but it was wrong with her. We had lots of it, instances of civic breakdown, particularly among adolescent kids, uh, when they were confronted with people unlike themselves. We had a lot of gang violence when I lived there and so on. And precisely the notion is, we found, was how could we provide settings that would kind of overcome this notion of either a neighbor or a, a, an adversary. It's why we, when I was in the Planning Commission in New York, we built hundreds of, uh, of basketball courts where people could, kid, adolescents could play sports together. They're very unsightly. A basketball court is not like a square in London. It looks horrible but it was an effective way and a very visceral one of getting people who um, could otherwise be quite hostile together. And the same is, I think, true um, in designing parks, that they should be places where um, old people are mixed in with, kids playing, There's, um, the, this is not an, uh, an original idea to mine, it was uh, the uh, Dutch architect Aldo van Eyck said, when you really have a good uh, uh, park, people don't keep to themselves. And, uh, you know, it's a different mentality than creating a nice, friendly, warm, place. You, you create something different where people who are unlike can meet. It's a little like the diplomacy question. How do you, how do you create spaces which meet people who, which mix people who are not the same? That's my view. I think, I think that there's another question here which speaks to some of what you've already said was do you have any thoughts on Roger Scruton's thoughts that classic aesthetic beauty should be a prerequisite for building planning, anti-brutalism stroke utilitarianism? I think oh. what you've said about the basketball courts already gives us a hint as to how you might respond yeah. to that question. Uh, yes, I don't think you should build a basketball court where the uh, net is supported by a Greek column. I don't think that's, that's really how it goes. I mean, there is a serious issue in what he's saying, which is that um, you know, what makes a place, what makes a place, you know, look aesthetically pleasing. But his answer to that was, uh, it can only be pleasing if it, if it harks back to something that was past. And, um, you know, it's this kind of simple opposition of the beautiful, which was then, and the utilitarian, which is now. That, that has to be wrong. And, uh, but it, it, you know, he's getting at something that, that is, um, um, it's a serious question. I mean, what makes a space beautiful? And I would say the answer to that question is in its social relations rather than in its physical attributes. I mean, I like classical architecture, but um, it's irrelevant, I think, to the real measure of beauty, which is, um, uh, I don't know if your questioner knows uh, the work of the philosopher Lane Scarry on beauty. It's well worth reading. Just so the beautiful is the heart, is the um, compatibility of differences with each other. And I think that's a really good, um, both social and I would say artistic vision as well. You know? um, anyhow, that's, that's 
uh, so I, did, I, I don't agree with Roger Scruton. Um, he was, a, by the way, a very good writer on music and he knew absolutely nothing about it. It was phenomenal. I knew him a bit. It was absolutely phenomenal. He knew he had fabulous taste and he, he didn't know what he was hearing, but he knew whether it was something that was moving or not, whether whether a performance worked or not. Uh, and of course, he was very forthright in declaring what was good and bad without being able to explain it. But it, he, um, he was kind of idiot savant. You know the expression, you know, just somebody who had this kind of intuitive uh, feeling for music. But I don't think that was true of his writings about, about art more generally. I think, Joe, is it about time? Yes, I think I think uh, our, our hour is, is just about up. No. It's a real pity um, we haven't managed to get through more of the questions and it would be lovely to carry on. But um, shall I just say a few words by way of wrapping up? Yes, please. Um, Richard, thanks so much for your time and your generosity today. Um, there are some people on the call who will probably feel like they've been in conversation with you for decades as they've been reading your, your book. So it's, it's been really nice to, to actually be in conversation with you. So thank you very much. Um, thanks also to other people. There's been a technical team behind this who've helped us. Um, and the audience for the questions. I should say that um, a recording of the session will be posted on the YouTube channel of the Southampton Institute for Arts and Humanities. Oh, so for people who, who want to go, go and have another listen, um, please do so. And may I just stand by thanking you. These were wonderful questions, a wonderful discussion, and I wish we could do more of it. Thank you very much, Richard. It's been an, an absolute pleasure to, to have you as our guest this evening. OK, well, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. bye. Goodbye.